Hi, everyone. Let's talk gifted. So tonight's office hours, I have three questions um, that I'm going to be answering. The first question is about grading. And this one I got a while ago, which is why I was able to set the stream for it. And then I have another question on rubrics. And I have another question on using depth and complexity with for math teachers. So like, do I have any specific tips for math? So if you have any other questions in addition to that, please feel free to throw it in the chat. I'll be answering those. So let me start with the grading question. You guys, I got this question a few weeks ago and I have been chomping at the bit to answer this question. So here's what it says. I'm curious on your thoughts. And um, she says, my GT child is in seventh grade. So she started middle school during the pandemic. She's in GT and pre-AP classes. And I just realized how poorly prepared she will be when it comes to study habits. She is allowed to literally retake any test or assignment for full credit. For example, this week she made a 70 on her history test and she said, no big deal, I can make it up. She got to go back in to make a 100. I asked her if she studied and she said no. At first I thought this is something that they're doing to coddle kids after the pandemic, but after speaking with other friends, this has been going on a long time in middle school and high school. Now I understand that grades aren't everything that matter, but what they are doing terrifies me because my daughter isn't taking deadlines seriously and not ever worrying about studying. How can she be prepared for real life when her attitude is, meh, I'll just retake it for a 100. Anyway, what are your thoughts? Because as a parent, this drives me bananas. Okay, and this person is also a teacher. Okay, I have so many thoughts about this. So the first thing I would say is, we, um, I, I wanna approach a bunch of different aspects of it individually. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of silo out all of these issues. So the first issue is the, um, being allowed to retake stuff. So I truly believe that that idea came down. It like rolled downhill from administrators who were concerned because there were a lot of kids who were failing and they don't like people failing and they don't like people dropping out. And so we started getting into this idea of like, well, we'll just let them retake it. And I feel like this practice goes very closely with, and you see it a lot of times in a company with, um, that teachers aren't allowed to give a zero. There'll be school districts where they're only allowed to get like the lowest grade they can give as a 50. And all of this, all of this to me is madness. And the reason I think it's madness is because if we're going to say that grades matter, then they either matter or they don't. It's like we want to have it both ways, that we want the grades to matter. But at the same time, we want there to be this huge caveat that says, except for how they don't really matter. And I think that's a very confusing message to send to students. Now, we could have the discussion about whether, you know, grading is appropriate or, you know, whether grading is even valuable. But if you're in a system where grading is the system, then this type of thing sends a very mixed message. So I want to, I'm going to answer all of this, but then I'm also going to circle back and answer the question about what about like the minimum grade being a 50, because I think it is connected to this and I think it's like equally damaging. All right. So why is it a problem to enable students to take stuff over and over again? All right. So I think this teacher slash parent hit the nail on the head as far as the difficulty that it is to get kids to take the work seriously. And why is it important that kids take work seriously? Well, part of how, and actually I just got done doing a couple days with the Ohio Association for Gifted Children for their Teacher Academy conference. And in that conference, in one of the sessions, I actually debuted a new session on the role of practice. And one of the things that we learn in the science of learning and that the researchers are constantly doing more studies on, and the more studies are done, the more robust this body of work becomes, that 
the brain tends to value what it believes it will be tested on. Like if you hear something, it's almost like if you hear an announcement that you know doesn't have anything to do with you, you're less likely to really process that announcement. The same thing is true of grading. Like if you just say, um, like if you just say, oh, um, I know there's this test, but I can retake it if I want to. That doesn't, that doesn't really have an impact on the way that we think. That's not going to give you the mental energy you need to do the work you need to do. So now I think part of the issue here is what we mean by studying. And I'm going to come back to that in just one second. When we allow students to retake work, what we send the message is that on the day of testing, this experience is meaningless. And that is dangerous because our bodies prepare us through the use of neurotransmitters and hormones for stressful situations. And those hormones and chemicals in our brain, and these are things like epinephrine, um, even cortisol as a stress hormone, adrenaline, these hormones are regulators of our emotions to some extent, and that, that, that is somewhat of an oversimplification. But when you're in a clutch situation, your body is trying to help you perform your best. So like if you watch Michael Phelps, when he's about to swim in the Olympics, he's like at the edge of the pool and he's jumping in and jumping out, and jumping in and jumping out. His body is like physically jittery. That is all of this chemical reaction to the fact that He's taking this experience very seriously. And even though it looks like nerves, it actually improves performance. If you don't have any nervousness whatsoever, your performance will actually be lower. You just don't take it that seriously. So we want a little bit of nervousness. And so I think that's one of the main problems with doing it this way is that while the child is in the actual act of taking the assessment, they do not have available to them all of the hormones and chemicals that they need in their body to help them do their best. And they've got, you know, they don't have enough dopamine flooding in. They, they're missing out and we're actually hampering them. We're hamstringing them. There needs to be a sense that this has meaning, that this has purpose. We know from research that has been well written about in Dan Pink's book, Drive, that part of what drives internal motivation is autonomy and mastery and purpose. If we take away the idea of purpose in what's being done, we're going to demotivate students. So to me, the greatest danger in this is that students will be demotivated and then they will be demotivated and they'll do less well than they otherwise would have, which then becomes even more of a demotivator. Connie, thank you for your sweet comment. Um, it becomes more of a demotivator because we like to do, this is again in Dan Pink's Drive, he talks about it. If you don't want to read peer-reviewed research journals, highly recommend Dan Pink's book, Drive. But what happens is that as you get demotivated once, then the next time that same situation comes up, you're even less motivated because you weren't very motivated. So you didn't do very well because you didn't do very well. You don't have that sense of mastery. And because you don't have that sense of mastery that demotivates you further, which then makes you perform even less well. And we can get into a real downward spiral. Like this could be alone, something that could lead to some pretty significant underachievement. So that to me is like public enemy number one is anything that demotivates, anything that is dangerous to internal motivation. So, so far we have two issues with this practice of unlimited retake or retake of even very high stakes things for full credit. So I am going to talk about what I think we should do instead, but I'm going to keep talking about why this is a problem for just a little bit. So we've got demotivation. And then we also have that that's just not how we function best neurologically, that the science of learning is very clear that the brain needs to feel like there's something going on here. 
So, um, and Teacher Likes Books says, setting a purpose is so important for students and for all of us, right? Like there needs to be a purpose to this. Why am I doing this? If what we're going to say is, this doesn't matter, you can retake it whenever, then what we're really saying is, this is just a practice. This is just a practice. And that's dangerous because now it leads to a third problem I see, which is that, especially for our GT kids, a lot of them are already overscheduled. A lot of them already are spending more time on schoolwork than is really healthy, either physically or emotionally. By building in retake to the system, we're basically saying this same assessment that should have taken 30 minutes is now worth like 75 minutes of your life because you have to walk to the classroom again and take it again. I think just as another issue with this, that it is oftentimes more problematic for students whose parents aren't going to follow up. So they don't do very well the first time. And that parent isn't going to push them to go back in for a retake. They're just going to take their 52 and walk away and be happy. And so I think that that's problematic in that it's to some extent, this may sound like I'm catastrophizing this, but I do think it's an equity issue. And some people think that retaking is an equity issue, but I see it from the other perspective because retakes privilege people with privilege. The retakes are most beneficial to students who care about their grades and whose parents care about their grades and whose parents are going to make sure they show up to do that retake or that the kid is going to have their own motivation to do that, which you're demotivating them. And so you're making it less likely that that will happen because pretty soon a kid is not going to be available to come in for a retake and they're just going to walk away with that 70. And then it's it goes along with that idea of like, oh, well, I might as well be hung for a sheep as a lamb right? Like I'm going to go ahead and just like, I might as well just not retake that one. I got a 60 on because I got a 70 on that one and I didn't make the time to go retake it. So what difference does it make? Right? We, we start getting into some very, very, very controversial mathematics with regard to grading. All right. The next problem is that when it was, when the teacher mentions that um, her child isn't taking deadlines seriously, so there's spillover, right? Like if I tell you that this test you're taking doesn't really matter, I'm also sending the message that nothing we really do in here matters and that no matter how late. No, seriously, a friend of mine, a friend of mine posted in Facebook today. I was going to pull it up and read it to you. A friend of mine posted, this is just ironic that this was in um, Facebook today. So he posted on, um, uh, he sent, he put with the name blurred out of the student, a uh, email that he got from a student today. And this guy's an English teacher. It says, dear Mr. So-and-so, I don't wanna say his name just for protection of his students. I apologize for not messing you, messaging you earlier, but I was unable to complete my essay last night because I went to see the new Batman movie and I proceeded to pass out as soon as I got home. It was really good. I don't know if this student is referring to the Batman movie or the passing out after. I'm not sure, but it was really good. I was wondering if I could be able to submit it later tonight for full credit, though. Let me know if you're willing to agree. Thanks in advance. This is exactly what we are creating. And Teacher Likes Book says this is a lesson in ethics, right? She's talking about depth and complexity, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, actually. One of our questions coming up is a depth and complexity question. So, yeah, this is an issue, right? Because now this student is so used to being able to turn in work late that they are just assuming that a, no, any excuse, no matter how ridiculous, I went to a Batman movie on a weekday. And here's the thing is, did you notice, did you pick up on what the assignment was? It was an essay. Do you think for a minute that my friend Ben assigned that essay that day? Friends, the answer is no. This kid had had that essay for a long time, but they were waiting till the last minute. Why? Partly because that's what they do, which is bad, <laughs> but also partly because they have been taught over time now that there's no such thing as a deadline. Now, what I responded to my friend's post, because he was like, what do y'all think? And what I said was, I accept late work, but I accept it in the same way that a mortgage company does. And that is with a penalty. And if you get too many of these penalties, it starts to affect your credit. So I think that it's very important for us to be sharing with students that deadlines do matter. Now, I think there are two issues with this. 
One is that we say like, oh, in the real world, there are deadlines. But friends, school is the real world. It's not like it is an alternate universe. School is not the Truman Show, right? School is a real world. And in that real world, there are deadlines that matter. I think one of the things that we fail to do sometimes is that we fail to share with kids why the deadlines matter. We don't give them the reason behind the deadline. We don't tell them why they should be turning in stuff on time. And one of the reasons to turn stuff in on time is so that the teacher can get it evaluated and then discuss it with students while it's fresh. That's neuroscience. Like that's the science of learning that fast feedback is important. It's also part of the research that's been done by Anders Ericsson on deliberate the role of deliberate practice in the development of expert performance. And so there are two different fields of research, both coming to the same conclusion, which is that feedback, timely feedback is critical in development of skill. So if we get work that's turned in late, then it's more likely that the teacher won't grade anybody's work until they feel like they've collected all of it, or they don't have time to grade this work now because they had set aside time to grade it before, and now this student's turning it in late, and now they have to grade it again, but maybe they don't have that time set aside. And so now you're gonna have a delay in feedback for somebody, and that's a problem. The next problem with this is that it sends the message that just school in general doesn't matter that much. And that's a very dangerous message to send. So what do I think that should be done instead? What do I think is a better alternative? I think a better alternative is that a student needs to score a minimum score in order to do a retake. And in order to do a retake, um, then well, not in, so that's the rule. In order to do a retake, you have to score at least a minimum score. Unless a student's absent. Obviously, I'm not talking about absences. I'm talking about when a student bombs a test, right? They have to score at least something. Why do I say that? One, because otherwise we're just inculcating that, that environment of disrespect. Disrespect for the work, which is disrespect for yourself. If you disrespect my work, you are disrespecting me. Now, do I feel like that's always a healthy dynamic? No, right? Like I'm not my product. However, especially people who've worked really hard, it's hard to separate out, right? Like I put my heart and soul into that and I really wanted to do well. If I don't do well, I'm going to feel badly. Like that's just human nature. And so we're going to, we, we send the message, what you're doing isn't really important. And so I want students to take it seriously enough so that they score at least a certain percentage in order to do a retake. The second reason for having to score a minimum score in order to take a retake is that if I don't have them score a minimum score, then they could just get like a five or something. And then um, they're going to cram for the retake opportunity, which is poor learning. So I don't want kids cramming. I want kids practicing and retrieving this information over and over again all through their learning. I don't want cramming. By allowing these retakes, we are saying cramming is the best suggestion we have for you, right? Like, don't worry if you bomb this test because you can cram for a retake. That is not good. So what I would prefer to a retake is, okay, so... I think you should have to have a minimum score. The second rule is there should be a maximum score that the retake can earn. Retakes should not be available for a 100. The 100 is available on the day of it, right? I'd like you to consider for a moment that like I'm doing this live, right? I'm doing this live and people can watch the replay. The replay will be up on my YouTube channel and on the Facebook um, page forever, right? I'm not taking it down. It's there and you can go watch it. However, there's a little bit of a penalty. Um, I'm not trying to punish people for not watching the live replay, but I am, especially because I really, on this particular one, didn't do a very good job of letting people know it was coming. Um, 
but it's that you can't participate in the chat. If you have a question, you can't, like, I got questions emailed to me that I'm answering, but if you have a question that you want answered, you can't ask it. You can't connect with other teachers. You can't see this teacher likes books is like always here. And I want to connect with her. Like she seems cool. You can't do that. Right. Connie, Coba neighbor put a nice comment. Like I can't connect with Connie. I can't like say, Oh, are you a teacher too? And can we be friends? Right? Like, so there's an opportunity missed cost. Right. And there needs to be that dynamic in doing the retake that you want to incentivize kids to do well the first time there needs to be some kind of benefit and that benefit i think it depends on the level of student i i think it depends on the difficulty of the assessment i wouldn't want to say a hard and fast number except that i would never i would never allow a retake to be done for more than 85 or 90 probably not 90 i probably wouldn't allow a retake to earn an a there was a true retake again i'm not talking about absences so I do understand that some teachers are forced to do this because it's district policy. And if there are any administrators watching, especially superintendent, I was this terrible policy. This is terrible policy. It disincentivizes. It goes against everything we know about the science of learning. Now, what we also should be doing are a bunch of low stakes quizzes. So I think that in this particular scenario of how the students are allowed to take the test over and over again. That's a problem. But a bigger problem is that the reason that the student didn't score as well is partly due to the fact that the teachers aren't giving frequent low stakes quizzes about that material, that they're teaching, 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 test, teaching, 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 teaching quiz, teaching, 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 test. Instead, what we should be doing is teach quiz, teach quiz, teach quiz, teach quiz, teach quiz. Teach quiz. And so the students are constantly applying what they're learning in a low stakes quiz. That is what we know from the research is what is effective. So the problem is a lot deeper than just should be kid, should kids be allowed to retake a test. The problem goes back to the pedagogy of instruction as a whole, and it goes back to the science of motivation, and it goes back to the science of learning. So it's not a very simple issue. It sounds simple, but when you start unpacking it, there are tons of ramifications. So what would I do instead? What I would do instead is I would say, if you score between a 50 and a 70, you may retake it. What I would really offer is not a retake, but test corrections where they don't retake the whole thing they go through and correct what they got wrong and explain where they went wrong. They have to say why they chose the answer they did. And then I would take that and I would give them additional credit on it up to a maximum of 85 or 90. That's what I would do. Not a retake, but test corrections with explanation. I want that if I'm going to let them retake it, it's not just to get them a better grade. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to cement the learning. So that's what I would do. So that's my opinion on that. I'm going to stop talking about that issue now and go on to the next question. But if anybody has any thoughts about that, push back against that, questions about it, feel free to throw them in the chat. Whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, I can see your questions in the chat. All right. So um, I'll and I'll keep looking for those. So the next question was, about how I do rubrics. So I do rubrics in a very weird way, um, different from most teachers. So, and I know that I, I know that my way is different. Okay. I, I know that, but let me, I'm going to see if I can navigate to a rubric so that I can show you what I mean by this. Um, what I do with rubrics is I don't do um, I don't do rubrics that are a column with a number, right? I don't do rubrics that are a column with a number. I do rubrics where it would be a descriptor. So let me go in and find, let's see what I'm trying to think of where the easiest place for me to find that rubric is. I got to think about where it was. Um, the, uh, if I could find it, I got to figure it out. 
Um, because I have one in a PowerPoint that I could easily share with you. So, um, but I think you can see what I mean. Instead of it saying like four, three, two, one, it would say amazing. Um, just what I was hoping for and you're getting there, right? Or something like that. Or um, like mastery, acceptable, emerging, something like that, right? Okay, you guys, I got to pause for a second and think about what session did I just share where I had that rubric in it? It was, hold on, I got to look. I got to look. It's so crazy. How could I forget it? I literally just did it two days ago. It was, it wasn't the practice one. Was it depth and complexity? I feel like maybe it was. So sorry. I should have pulled this up ahead of time. I wasn't planning on showing it, but then I was thinking it would probably really help you to have the rubric in front of you. Um, but I don't see it. Let me, I'm going to pull up this one and see if I happen to put it in here. I may have it in here. So why do I do this? Why do I have descriptors instead of numbers? So if I can find the example to show you, I'll show you. But if not, I'll just use my words. So the reason I do that is two reasons. Number one is that I want to be able to have, um, I want to be able to have the different rows worth different amounts. I want there to be a different I want there to be a different amount. Uh oh, I think I maybe just. There we go. Okay. Am I still showing? I got to come back. I'm, I'm like looking in a slide deck and I got to make sure I'm still on screen. Okay. So um, I got, I've got to make sure that each row doesn't have to be the exact same value as every other row. Why is that? Because not everything is worth the same amount right? Not everything is worth that. Um, I have like, for instance, okay, I'm going to stop looking because I can't really do two verbal tests at the same time because I'm human. But if I have students doing an essay, for example, and I've got a row in my rubric that says like the organizational structure, that's very important. It's more important than spelling. But I do need to have a row where I'm grading what I would call conventions, like spelling and grammar conventions. But let's say I want the organizational structure to be worth up to 10 points. I want the spelling and grammar conventions to just be worth a maximum of five points. And so if I have a four in the column, that won't work, right? I need, I, I can't say in the column how much it's worth if I want the rows to be able to be different. And I feel like that alone is essential. But there's another reason. The other reason is, and I wonder, you know what? I'm going to grab my, um, I'm going to grab my whiteboard and see if I can draw it out with a dry erase marker so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so sorry, I might be moving away from my. I had to go grab my dry erase markers. Okay, so um, the other reason is that I would like you to consider how often. Sorry for the rustling. Dry erase. Um, I would like you to consider how often you have students who have shown very different qualities of work and yet get the exact same score on the um, they get the exact same score on the assignment. So the reason that happens is because we only have so many columns in our rubric, and so we tend to round up. We tend to give kids higher grades than what they really deserve. And because if the rubric is a maximum of a four, then the next one down is three. Well, the difference between a four and a three is the difference between a 100 and a 75. And so we feel bad about giving a 75. And so we, um, and so we don't uh, do it. We give the 100, we give a four. What that means is that our students who did their best, like the students who did the best work in the class, they get the same grade as the students who just did mediocre, right? Okay, so what I do instead is I give a range. So instead of something being worth 
uh, four points or three points, if you score like the highest possible, it might be worth either 10, nine or eight. I'm gonna, I'm actually drawing this right now and I'll be able to show you what I mean. Instead of somebody, okay, so let's see if you can see this. Okay, so I have my, whatever they're being graded on, I just put one, two, three, right? These are like organizational structure, um, quality of thesis, spelling and grammar, whatever. Okay, so you see, I've got my descriptors, right? Super smiley face, straight face, blah. Okay, so four comma, I don't have like the description of what the really good one looks like, but four criteria one, you're like the happiest, you get the happiest, you can get either a 10 or a nine. For the middle, you can get an eight, a seven, or a six. For the lowest one, you can get a five, four, three, two, or one, right? And for this one, the maximum you can score is five. And you could get a five or you get a four or three or you could get a two, one or zero, right? And I could do the same thing. I don't have to even do tens and fives, right? I could say the highest you can get on this is eight points. You could also get seven um, or six, five, four, three, two, one, zero, right? So when I have a rubric like that, then it allows me to be way more precise in what the student's evaluation really should be. It allows me to hone in on, you did really great work, but there was still a place to grow. One of the problems with a standard rubric, one of the problems, I'll draw one on the other side of this. Um, by the way, friends, because you know I love office supplies, one of these kinds of dry erase boards that's actually like an easel, I have, I, I use this all the time. It is so, so helpful. Um, it even has like, I even have like magnets and stuff taped under it. Anyway, okay. So when I have a rubric, when I have a rubric that looks like you're used to, four, three, two, one. When I have a rubric that looks like this, then what happens is I can't be very precise because if I give you a four, um, there's nowhere for you to grow. Um, there's just nowhere. Sorry, the camera was trying to decide what to focus in on me or the or the whiteboard. There's nowhere for you to grow. You're going to be getting um, the highest score or a C. There's nowhere for me to show you how you could get better. Now, if you're teaching gifted kids, this is really dangerous because if you're teaching gifted kids, the message that you're sending with a standard rubric that's like really amazing, middle, and then nothing, what you're what you're sending with that is the message, I don't actually have anything to teach you. There's nowhere for you to grow. There's nothing left for you here. In the rubric like this, I can give a kid a nine and they can and I can give them some feedback. So I think um I just when I just recently shared this. In, the, in a conference, um, I got pushed back against the rubric that I used because a couple of teachers were saying, well, that's not very precise. That defeats the purpose of a rubric in evaluation. And I would say, no, actually it's more precise. It's more precise. I don't agree. The other thing I would say is that the real purpose of a rubric is twofold. The purpose of a rubric is not only to give not only to give students better more targeted feedback but it's also to give them a landmark to aim for in the work itself so they should be given the rubric prior to the assignment and where they see the descriptors it also gives them a cue when you do this as to where they should be spending their time right if i say an outline is worth 10 points and your spelling is only worth five points, then they're seeing like, whoa, right? Um, that's why I believe in these rubrics. So I have seen them work. Okay, so Teacher Likes Books has this comment. I like the 10 point rubric and it totally makes sense to me, but admin wants four point rubrics to model end of year state assessments. And I might kind of do what I think is best for students anyway. Okay, this is what I would do. This is what I would do in that, in that case. Let me get out my eraser because we all function in, okay, you know what? I'm going to use a teacher eraser. You know what a teacher eraser is? Your arm. Okay. So 
what I would do is, let me do it in a different color just in case it bleeds through. Also because I just like using different colors. Um, what I would do is, this is part of modeling how to prepare them for their state assessment. So I wouldn't worry about that at all. I think that's not bad. They need to see how it's gonna look there. Okay, so I would put up at the top my like amazing, and then I would put in parentheses what the state would say. So I'm going to show it to you in a second. Okay. And then in the rubric below, I would put what I'm doing for their thing right now. Okay. Let me show you what that would look like. This is why it's so good to be here live so that you can ask questions and make comments. Okay, so this is what I would do. I would put my descriptor, whoa, it's hard to do this backwards. Okay, I would put my descriptor, so amazing, and in the parentheses below it, four, to be a sign that like, that's how the state, that's what the state would give you. Um, and then below it, in where the description of the thing is, there I would put how I'm grading. So I'm going to give you either a 10 or a nine, or I'm going to give you a five, but the state would call that four. Here's the thing though. This, any high stakes test, it's, it's still going to be subjective, right? Like for instance, um, on the AP US history test uh, and world history too, like when you're writing, you basically, even on the essay part, as long as you score the points, you don't even have to fully put it in essay form. Like you're going to get your points. So they may say it's one thing, but how they actually score is just a little bit different. So I think that that's what I would do, but I would make sure that I was clear about what parts the state actually values because they don't always value what they say they're going to. That's a really good point. Okay, I had one more. And if anybody has any, um, if anybody has any, um, other questions, feel free to throw them in. I'm on my last question right now. The last question was, um, I teach math to gifted third through fifth graders. I just started dipping my toe into depth and complexity this semester, and I'm reading your Gifted Guild depth and complexity book. That's the book on depth and complexity that I wrote with Ian Bird. Um, and she said, math and depth and complexity seem so hard sometimes. Do you have any tips or resources for math teachers? So I have two resources. And then I've got some more tips. So thanks, Teacher Likes Books. I'm glad you like those that idea. Okay, so the first suggestion I have is you already have the book. That's one resource, right? You already have the book. If you get the um, Depth and Complexity Question Stems book, that's just question stems, and I'm like fluttering around with it because I have mine printed out like this. This is just an ebook. It's not a print book. It's only available in ebook format. Um, and it has all the depth and complexity questions from the book pulled out by element, but it's lots of different content areas. So you can look at just the questions for math. Now in the book, we do give a lot of math examples. So my biggest suggestion is make sure you understand the framework as a whole and use the resource that you have in the book. But additionally, the question book, the question stems book is helpful. You can find that um, on Teachers Pay Teachers. It's just, if you can find it on Amazon, you can find the Depth and Complexity Question Stems book on Amazon. Um, also available in my Teachers Pay Teachers store and on Amazon is the Depth and Complexity Quick Guide. The Quick Guide is particularly useful for math teachers because in the Quick Guide, you get a two page spread. And it has like, what is the element? So here we have language of the discipline, what it is, what it does, how it impacts thinking over here. And then on this side, what it looks like in the four main core content areas and also some question stems. But it gives you an example activity for every element and content imperative. Um, it, gives, it gives question, for the content imperatives, it just gives some questions. But let me give you an example. Um, okay, um, multiple perspectives. Here's a math example, for example, from the Quick Guide book. So it's Gifted Guilds, Depth and Complexity Quick Guide. 
All right. So for multiple perspectives for mathematics, all spatial reasoning is multiple perspectives. When we lift a two dimensional shape off of paper and into the air, spin it around and lay it back down, this element must come into play. Use multiple perspectives to bring concepts to life. How does to life rather? How does the right angle feel about the hypotenuse? Is it more important to the numerator or the denominator? Look at attributes too. Which number or operator is most powerful in this equation? So you'll find things like that where ever, for every single element, and sometimes it'll even have an activity. So like for patterns, this is what it says for math. Have students use a Venn diagram or similar graphic organizer to compare and contrast the patterns of different shapes or number sets. Then have them use those patterns to move towards a rule about them. So triangles and squares both have lines and angles, but triangles must have three sides or they are not a triangle. So we're moving from pattern to rule. Um, I every, every one of the 11 elements has math activities and ideas in the quick guide. Again, available for just a few bucks on Teachers Pay Teachers or Amazon. So those are two resources I would share for you. Now, some ideas. Math at its heart, most math teachers should start with patterns and rules. Almost all math is solved with patterns and rules. In the back of the Depth of Complexity Quick Guide, it has a page that's overwhelmed by choices. We can help how to choose which elements to start with. And the first thing it says is that some elements are a natural fit within certain content areas. For example, rules and patterns will apply to virtually every math problem. So we use what we're doing in math is we're teaching kids to recognize patterns and learn rules and then apply what they've learned about those patterns and the rules they've learned to any problem that they encounter. We're teaching in mathematics. We're teaching deep structure. We're not teaching just how to solve five times three or how to divide the fraction one fourth by one half. We're teaching how to divide any fraction that we see. We're teaching them to solve any problem that they see. So that's what we would call deep structure. And that's what language arts teachers do. And it's what math teachers do. Both language arts and math teachers are teaching deep structure. Both language arts and math teachers are teaching lots of patterns. Plot is pattern, right? So in depth and complexity with math, if I'm a math teacher, I'm going to start with patterns and rules. I'm then going to add in, and I'm going to start with patterns and rules by teaching, I'm going to be using those words. I'm going to be saying, is this a rule or a pattern? Right. So what is a pattern? A pattern is something that it has a recurring element that can be predicted, something that is a cycle. Um, so there are so many patterns in math, like the Fibonacci sequence and like even skip counting. Right. In a lot of ways, multiplication is a pattern. So a rule would be something that is either a method so a way of solving is a rule. A rule is also something that if it's broken, bad things happen. So um, I have a rule of the order of operations. If I don't follow the order of operations, bad things happen. I get the wrong answer, right? So um, when I'm working with math, I'm going to start with patterns and rules, and I'm going to make it very visible to students. I'm going to make it very visible that I'm talking about patterns and rules. I'm going to be emphasizing the depth of complexity. I'm going to be looking at, is this a pattern that also functions as a rule? Who might see this as a rule and who might see it as just a good idea, right? So I'm going to use patterns and rules. Then I'm going to add on details because the next thing I want students to do is to pull out the important details, because that's how we solve our problems, is that we identify the important details that we need to apply our patterns and rules so that we can solve our problem. Once I've done details and been working with students on pulling out important details, then I'm going to add in big idea. Because big idea is like theorems are big ideas. There are lots of things in math that are big ideas also, a solution could be a big idea, right? Like um, X equals 39 is the big idea of, you know, X divided by two is 78, 
right? The big idea of that is X equals 39. I always get nervous when I always get nervous when I'm giving examples that I'm just thinking of off the top of my head that like, am I doing that math correctly? Like I want to count on my fingers, but actually did do that math correctly. <laughs> so when I'm a math teacher, what I'm going to be doing is making sure I start with those elements and I'm going to be adding in the element of ethics. And if you watch the sessions that I've done now, um, just a hint to everyone who might see this is that my depth and complexity course is going to be coming out in the late, late spring, early summer. Um, so you guys will be able to have that. But in it, in my when I talk about depth and complexity, I will always share how ethics is so important with math because it gives students a reason to solve. And the way that you do that is by saying, is it fair or would it be fair, right? Um, I think you can also get into the ethics even of language of the discipline, right? So let me give you an example. An isosceles triangle is a triangle that has at least two equal sides. An equilateral triangle is a triangle where all three sides are equal. So some, some isosceles triangles are equilateral, like they have two equal sides, but they also have a third equal side. That's, that's an isosceles triangle but it's also an equilateral, but not all isosceles are equilateral. So all equilateral triangles are isosceles triangles, but not all isosceles triangles are equilateral. So that's an interesting thing to unpack. And we can use depth of complexity to unpack that, right? We can say, is it fair to say that equilateral, that, that, that isosceles is a subset of equilateral triangles? Which triangle is more interesting, equilateral triangle or isosceles triangle? Let's look at the etymology using language of the discipline. Let's look at the etymology of isosceles and equilateral and see where, where these work. Equilateral triangles are also equal angular. So is that true for isosceles as well? If they have two equal sides, will they also have two equal angles? That's maybe an unanswered question at the moment right? So I'm going to use depth and complexity to dive into my concepts. So it's interesting to me because oftentimes it's the math teachers who will push back against depth and complexity, not in a sense of like contrarianism, but just not seeing how it fits as well. I think because a lot of the examples that they see are language, arts, science, or social studies. But to me, but to me, it is the easiest of all of the disciplines. Okay, so I'm looking at NTJ Likes book says, and some isosceles are right triangles, but no equilaterals are right triangles. So that's interesting because then that would argue against isosceles being a subset of equilateral. Or we could say it's a subset of equilateral and right triangles. And so can something belong to two different set families? And we know the answer to that is true, right? So this is where depth and complexity can really help you, right? We're looking at patterns and rules for sets and rules for what makes an isosceles triangle and rules for what makes a right triangle and rules for what makes an equilateral triangle. And we're looking at rules. We're looking at rules for how you divide fractions. And then when we do divide the fraction, what does that pattern look like? Is the denominator getting larger or smaller as we divide fractions? If we multiply fractions, is the denominator getting larger or smaller? We're going to look for that pattern, right? So I think that the most important thing that math teachers can do is to set aside the idea that depth and complexity was done for all the other content areas and that they're just kind of the redheaded stepchildren, um, which I don't mean anything offensive by that. I have a child who is a redhead and has a stepdad. So we do have a literal redheaded stepchild. Uh, but we want to send the idea that math is not the redheaded stepchild of depth and complexity. In fact, math to me is the most aligned, the easiest, the easiest of all content. So you'll see lots of examples in the book and you'll see lots of examples in the other two resources I mentioned. And if you just got one, the one I would mention since you already have the book is the quick guide. Why? Because the question stems book pulls out all of the questions from the book and sorts them. 
Um, and it also does content imperatives and disciplinarianism. And it does have, it does have um, questions that the book doesn't, but you do have access to most of the questions. So I would say if you want another resource that's really handy, get the quick guide. Now the quick guide comes as an ebook. I printed mine out and bound it like this, but you can use it just on a device. All right, so that's my advice for math. Okay, don't see any other questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up. I wanna say thank you so much for joining me tonight. And thank you to those of you who submitted questions. You can always submit a question. And the way you can submit a question is either by commenting on the video, I will definitely see that, or you can always email me at lisa at giftedguru.com. And I usually do office hours once a month and I will answer your question at the next office hour. And sometimes I will also um, write an article about it for the website. So um, Teacher Likes Books says, I was gonna mention that add the lens of disciplinarianism to math to add depth. Absolutely, so we want students, that's such a good call, thank you so much for that. When we are doing um, math, we also want students to be approaching it as a mathematician, right? We want them to be approaching it as a mathematician would. What words would they use? What would they feel about it? What desires would they have, right? Like, so I would desire to explore it in, uh, like I would, if I noticed a rule, I would have a desire to put it in algebraic form, right? So, um, because man has never created a labor saving device to equal that of algebra. And so as a mathematician, I will want to express it in an algebraic form. So disciplinarianism is key. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, so Megan says, my math curriculum, can be so focused on skills. My experience so far is that depth and complexity helps me teach the big picture of math. Oh, Megan, yeah, good point, right? Is it, it helps kids get that big idea, right? That what's the big idea of what we're doing here? We're not just learning how to solve this problem. We're learning how to solve all two-step single variable problems. We're learning how to solve all of these kinds of things, right? We're learning how to factor all numbers. Karen Green, thank you so much for your compliment. You guys, if you don't know Karen Green, let you know what? Let me get Karen, let me ask you a favor. Please put, if you're still there, Karen's in the Facebook group or on the Facebook page. So it won't show up in the YouTube, but I'll add it to the um to the YouTube description later. Karen, would you put the link to your website in the comments? The reason I'm asking this is Karen is an amazing, gifted and talented advocate. She has been a school administrator a teacher. She has incredible passion for gifted kids. And she has retired from school administration and gone into doing coaching specifically with gifted kids. So if you have a gifted student, she's one of the few people I would say I could highly recommend. If you have a gifted kid who is struggling and she'll do stuff virtually, so it doesn't matter where you live. And she didn't ask me to do this. And I hope that she's still here. So she, I hope she didn't leave so she could put her link in. If she didn't, I'm going to have to put something about it on the website. But Karen Green is amazing. If you have a kid who's struggling with just life as a gifted student, with school and managing that or anything, Karen Green is your person. So I hope she's here to put her link in the comments because I highly recommend her. Thank you again so much, you guys, for joining me tonight. I hope that you have a wonderful evening. And if I don't see you before then, I will see you in the office hours next month. So take care and thank you again for your questions and your kind words.